Welcome to The Shift Show with Adriana Bucci. Join me every week to learn all about narcissistic abuse recovery, healing from physical and emotional pain after the abuse, and everything else to do with toxic people and how they affect your physical, emotional, and mental health. And no, you are not the crazy one. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. Let's get right to it. Hey, Tina, welcome to the podcast. How's it going? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. We'll start off with, uh, you know, letting the audience know a bit of who you are and your story. So I will pass the mic off to you and uh, we'll get the show on the road. Perfect. Well, you know, um, no one chooses this path of working in the the realm of narcissistic abuse. Um, You know, as we talked about earlier, I think it's chosen for us. And uh, there are some people who go through something really hard and especially like this, and they don't ever want to look back. Um, I refer to myself often as the accidental author and family court advocate. Um, because this was not the path I chose, um, but it, it, I do believe things happen the way they're supposed to. So back in 2008, I was in a really toxic, abusive marriage, and I ended up on a therapist's couch wanting to know what my part of it was and how I could fix myself, because I had heard for so many years that it was me. And I was the problem. And so I, I, that's really how I ended up in therapy. And I remember sitting there and just for the first time, emotionally vomiting my entire (laughs) life onto this poor therapist. And at the end of the hour, she got up and she walked across the room and brought back the DSM-5 and had me read the excerpt on narcissistic personality disorder. And she said, you know, I I can't diagnose this person. I'm not qualified to do that. I've never met him, but everything you're telling me, this is what it sounds like. And I, you know, the (laughs) rose colored glasses optimist in me, I was so excited because if we had a label, I could fix it. (laughs) And that was really, I was like, great. Now, what do we do? This is so exciting. Like I was so happy to just make make sense of my marriage and what had gone on. And when I read it, I thought, no, this is him 100%. And I remember she, she looked at me and now I get it. And she, she looked so compassionate and she said, you know, there's really nothing anyone can do. There's no medication. There's no therapy. You either accept that this is your life or you leave. Mm -hmm. And I was angry. And I, I just thought, how dare she tell me I can't fix my marriage. And so I went home that day and I was excited telling him, you're a narcissist. Oh boy. (laughs) I can imagine how that went. (laughs) Well, you know, back then, you know, there was nothing out there on the topic. And so we, I remember he and I sat down and we looked it up together, like what this means. And, And he read it and he goes, well, you know, that sounds like my dad, but I don't think that's me. And in my mind, I'm thinking we just took a huge step forward because he and his dad are the same person. <laughs> so oh boy. we're one step closer to him accepting that this is who he is. And um, oh my gosh, I just want to go back in time and hug myself back then because <laughs> I don't blame you. Poor little thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then it was about another eight months, uh, you know, he agreed to go to therapy with me, but he, this is funny, true to narcissistic fashion. It had to be a male, um, PhD. Yeah. And so we found someone and, um, it was about six months into that process where the, the psychologist said, I really think a psych eval is in order. Like there are just some, you know, I can hear you saying you're sorry about things, but I don't feel that you're really Mm -hmm. sorry. I I feel like these are empty words. Mm -hmm. And that was the day my ex-husband said, we're done. Wow. Yeah. He's the one that actually called the marriage. 
and 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 of course he blamed me for manipulating the psychologist oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. i'm much much more powerful than i give myself credit for apparently i can <laughs> i'm surprised he didn't manipulate the psychologist because that's usually what this you hear guy, happens. <laughs> this guy had a background of working in prisons with okay, absolute perfect. narcissists and sociopaths so he was so versed in it yeah he saw right through and him <laughs> He saw right through him. And, and so that day when he said, I think we need to do a psychological evaluation, that was it. That was the end game. And my ex-husband called me on, we had taken separate cars to that meeting oh boy. and he called me afterwards. And he said, I just called the doctor and I let him know we're done. You've manipulated him. Um, and our marriage is over. I'm not doing this. And I'm like, Okay. And it felt like the biggest weight off my shoulders mm -hmm. that someone had called it, you know, because I had been, I, you know what it's like when you, you're in that fog for so long. And I remember around that time, my brother had come to visit. My brother said, I don't even recognize you anymore. You know, your spark mm -hmm. is gone. Um, you aren't you. And what is going on? And I thought I was putting up this great front and facade <laughs> on the perfect little family. And apparently I wasn't, you know, no. you're just so beaten down. So when he said we're done, it was, I, I was actually grateful. And uh, that was where my marriage came to an end. But then I, you know, found myself, I had two very little girls. They were two and four years old at the time. And, um, thinking back then i was still i i guess um he, well because he had never really participated in their lives mm -hmm. and i thought this is going to force him to step up to the plate and be a dad mm -hmm. if he has to have them one-on-one -on -one, um during his parenting time it was before i understood how damaging a narcissist can be to a child and um I guess before I understood that the children just become weapons and pawns to them yep. in child custody situations. Mm -hmm. And so still the naive part of me was like, this is great. He's going to have to wake up and make them breakfast and, you know, go take them to the park. And, and they need that. They need a dad. And so, yeah, just the, the naivety that yeah. most of us have before we really grasp what we're up against. Yeah, 100%. So what ended up happening with like all the custody stuff with him? Oh. Did he try to use those pawns? <laughs> oh boy. He, yeah, no, it's um a few years, we started our battle in 2009. And I really thought if left to his own, he's not going to ask for any custody of them because he has no bond with them. You know, during our marriage, I considered my co-parent to be our nanny. Mm. I would have never even thought to ask him for help um, with the with the girls at any point in our marriage. And so when he started fighting for custody, I was in shock and, and couldn't understand, you know, what this was about. So he was asking for 50, 50 custody. And first what? of all, I'm thinking, yeah, first of all, I'm thinking he lives, well, he had just moved four hours away. You can't <laughs> share custody of a two and four year old from four hours away. Yeah. So that doesn't even make sense. But you know, what I quickly learned is for the narcissist, it's all about winning and it's mm -hmm. about control and it's about hurting you. And, you know, when he knew the girls were my number one button and the number one way to hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so it became World War Three, you know, it, right out of the gate. Um, the second year of our custody battle, we were in court 13 times just that year alone. Wow. So I became, you know, I'd walk into the courthouse and the bailiff would say, hi, Miss Swithin. <laughs> <I just laughs> so when the bailiff starts recognizing yeah. you when you're going through security check, that says a lot. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> um, and because of, you know, my ex-husband had controlled the finances during our oh. marriage. And so I was left with nothing. I found myself in a local domestic violence shelter with my daughters, um, $200 to my name. I couldn't afford an attorney, but he could. So 
I walked into family court on a very uneven playing field yeah. and, um, you know, had to represent myself. Um, it turned out to be a 10 year battle. Oh. And yeah, but I will tell you, I was one of the success stories. Amazing. I successfully, it took from 2009 to 2000, I'd say about 13, um, before I protected my kids physically. Um, you know, he was not allowed to have visits with them at all. And then in 2019, I successfully terminated his parental rights. Amazing. So he has no custody of all, at all, um, nice. no legal rights. So yeah, but it, you know, it's what a journey. Shit show, um, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I kind of, I don't know if you've seen, I, I created a wheel. It's called the post-separation abuse wheel. Mm -hmm. And it was literally the playbook of what my ex-husband did. And now being where I am today and I'm happily remarried and my daughters are teenagers and they're doing fantastic. You know, uh, so many of the moms that I talk to and some dads also, they, they see this wheel and they're like, oh my God, that's literally the narcissist playbook during a child custody battle. Um, it has nothing to do with the kids or their desire to really be a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. They're, they literally become weapons. It's true. Yeah. Wow. So did he ever like visit the kids at all or take them oh, in yeah. at any time? Oh yeah. He, mm -hmm. um, he exercised his parenting time. He, you know, it started out, he had a, almost a pretty equal parenting time share um, wow. because the courts are very broken. And, you know, I was so, back then I didn't realize the reality of the court system and what, you know, even a parent who has never participated in a child's life, if they step up to the plate and say, Hey, put me in, I want to give this a try. The courts are going to give them the opportunity. And I think that has to do with, you know, the courts become so overburdened by deadbeat parents mm -hmm. that anyone who steps up, as long as they have a pulse mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, they aren't actively doing drugs in the courtroom in front of the judge, <laughs> you know, the judge is going the bar to is go, very low, <laughs> right? The, the bar is, and that's one of the things I say, you know, my threshold of what's acceptable as a healthy parent is completely different from what the court's threshold of yeah. what's acceptable. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, and I see it through a different lens now um, as a family court advocate, because they see the worst of the worst, you know, they see the extreme abuse cases, kids with broken bones. And, and um, so that's the scale in which everyone is judged. And if you don't fit on that scale, you know, and, and what we know about narcissistic abuse is that it's so much of it is psychological and emotional. And, and then it becomes, he said, she said, and it's, or she said, she said, or he said, he said, it's impossible, you know, for the judge to know most of the time, they don't know either parent. And for all they knew, I was a pathological liar who was just making, you know, and that's kind of the lens that I now look through it is I wouldn't want their job either. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're forced to make some pretty hard judgment calls. And, and with a narcissist, they're, they're such good liars and so many abuse victims because of anxiety or PTSD we can end up presenting as the one that looks a little unstable because we're driven by emotion and we're trying to protect our kids. And so they're just looking at this like shell-shocked person who is trembling in the courtroom and they, you know, it's, 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 and, and what I find is that most family court professionals, and this is a worldwide issue, you know, it's not just here in the US or up there in Canada, they're not trauma informed, they're not DV informed. And so, you know, victims of domestic violence end up looking problematic to the court and the narcissist can put on quite a show. Um, the family court system becomes their stage. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. It's like, you're, it's such a lose, lose situation when you're the one who's not the narcissist and you're trying to do what's right for your kids and you know what the facts are, but 
they're so good at manipulating the system and the system's so broken already that it just, it's such an exhausting battle. Absolutely. And I, I feel like for me, the turning point was really looking at it through the lens of the family court system that mm -hmm. to them, these are just business transactions. There's right. no emotion in it and emotion, you know, most judges, most attorneys are highly narcissistic themselves mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe not full blown diagnosable, but they're at least pretty high on the scale. Mm -hmm. And so emotions make them uncomfortable. And so when I started looking at it through the lens of strategy and watching other attorneys, I would go plop myself down in the courtroom on days where the cases were not mine and just oh, wow. observing other cases and beginning to learn the reality of the system and and kind of get more into a strategy mindset. Um, and, and I feel like that was really the shift in my case where I started to be able to protect my kids. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. That's such a great <laughs> idea to just like observe, you know, because when you're right. in it, when you're in it and I know, you know, the past, you know, over the past year, um, so many things have gone online. And so mm -hmm. now you can watch a lot of court proceedings online. I'll be working here at my desk and, and having a zoom, um, court, co you know, hearing going on cool. in the background. <laughs> so it's even more accessible for a lot of people to observe. And, and I highly recommend it. You know, if, if you can get in front of your own judge and just watch, you know, what, matters to them, you know, procedures that other attorneys follow, um, strategies that other attorneys use and what the judge seems to cling on to, you know, those things can really go a long ways towards, you know, you being able to protect your kids. Mm -hmm. That's a really great idea. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. very helpful for me. Yeah. <laughs> that was so smart. Seriously. <laughs> and somewhere in there, I think it was about 2012, um, I started writing my first book. So I, you know, and it was it was a way for me to process and purge what I was going through because back then I truly believed I was the only person in the world. You couldn't find any articles online about it. And mm -hmm. so I started this book. I had never written a book before. I'm not a writer. And, uh, you know, it, everything just kind of unfolded. Um, and my, I had an online blog back then, One Mom's Battle. And it was just a way for me to document this insanity that I was living. Um, and that made no sense to me. And so it was a way for me to kind of look at it and go, okay, no, this really happened. <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> wrote this blog and I can read it. And, you know, it's it because you're in such a fog in that battle portion also, because um, I never even had time to go through the healing of narcissistic abuse before I found myself in this family court nightmare. And um, so writing, you know, whether it's a journal, you know, I always recommend to people, write your story because when you're able to pick it up and actually read it back, you're like, wow, yeah, <laughs> I, I've been through a lot. I give myself a lot of credit, you know, it's survival mode, but that outlet of being able to write books or blogs or whatever was really my healing journey. Yeah. Writing is so cathartic and I'm so glad that you, you know, you made it into a blog because that helps so many people too with their journeys who are going through similar things because divorcing a narcissist, not something I've ever done, but definitely, you know, I was the child of a narcissistic divorce, so I can totally oh. empathize with it. Yeah, I was, I was the pawn. It was good times. You were the pawn. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> so wow. definitely it's so great to be able to like write all of that stuff out. And once you get those thoughts out and like onto paper or in a book or on a blog or whatever, it gives them less, like it gives those thoughts less power over you. Absolutely. And when you start hearing from other people, oh my God, I could have written this. This is exactly mm -hmm. what I went through. You start to realize that the narcissist isn't as smart as you gave them credit oh, yeah. for. <laughs> They're that so predictable. Just, right. This, this, um, 
I always say there's some type of hidden manual that they all use. I it's know. like they're they're they, all the same stuff. they just pass it around and it's I'm sure it's some underground network somewhere <laughs> that they're like, hey, dude, try this. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, they have some kind, they have the exact same playbook. Like it doesn't matter what country you're from, what culture you're from, where you're at in the world, your age, nothing like that. It's they're all the same. <laughs> they're all the same. And and once you start putting those pieces together, you're kind of looking, you know, I people ask me a lot, you know, have you forgiven him? And I say, you know, that's a mixed bag. And I feel like it's a, a different journey for everyone. For me, it's been forgiving myself for the red flags that I overlooked as a young 20 something year old girl who was, you know, really truly seeing the world through rose colored glasses and, and seeing the best in people to a fault. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's been more of a journey of compassion to where now I can look at him and think, you know, I see the five-year-old little boy in there because I believe that's where he's emotionally stunted. I feel like that's where his trauma is, is probably around the age of five. And so I can look back at him as a five-year-old and say, I feel compassion for him because no one would choose this life, mm -hmm. you know, void of emotion and love and true connection and authenticity with other people, no one would choose that. And, and so, you know, I can look back and see him with compassion when I view him as a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, it's quite a journey to, yeah. to go through something yeah. like this. And, um, and, and, you know, when I, I remember when I started my blog and I titled, titled it One Mom's Battle, it was because I really did believe I was the only person <laughs> in the world going through this. And so to connect with, and that's where I love how this whole world of narcissistic abuse has evolved because we are so connected and connecting with other people and hearing stories and sharing stories and realizing I'm not crazy. This was not me. You know, this is something so much bigger. And I always say I am filled with gratitude because the, the people that I meet through this journey, it's like the narcissist pre-screens the best friends you could ever have because we all share similar qualities and traits. And, you know, they target people who are exact opposites of themselves. And uh, so once you get into these communities, you find some pretty good friends. So true. It is so true. Some of the best friends I've made in the past couple of years have been through this community. And it's just amazing how supportive everyone is and understanding. And, you know, it's it sucks what happened to all of us but at the end of the day like to have this new sense of community and all of these people who get it and to help each other through it is freaking amazing absolutely wow. yeah. so tell us a bit about what you do with um with like your clients and helping other you know parents going through these types of battles Sure. So and how you got into it and all that. How I got into it. So when I used to go and just sit in the courtroom and just watch other cases, I'm surprised no one ever took out a restraining order against me <laughs> because I would watch other cases and I would instantly feel connected with these moms. And I would be like, oh my God, this is exactly my story. This is what she's going through. And so on a break during court, I would follow them out into the hallway and I'd be like, hi, my name is Tina. We have a lot in common can we go do coffee or lunch? I'll buy you lunch, you know? And so I give my cards out to people and I started forming like a little group of women in my area and we'd support each other for court and, and, you know, bounce ideas off each other and co-parenting strategies. And over time, it just through my blog and my book, I started having people reach out to me for advice on custody related issues co-parenting communication, um, you know, how to empower our kids and, and really be there for them. Because I, I'm a firm believer that if a child has at least one rock in their life, a healthy parent, they can come through this and mm -hmm. be thriving. So I started, you know, just answering people's emails and, 
connecting with people. And at one point, I think it was about 2014, someone said, you really should turn this into a business. There's a huge need for it. So I started coaching people back then. I don't even know if there was a such thing as a divorce coach back then. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to call myself. Right, and right. so I, I started kind of this website. I left my career and, and merged into this and just jumped in like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And now I'm to the point where, you know, there's very few people doing the work of the family court system mm -hmm. and, and the, the co-parenting issues that come up. Um, and so I got to the point where I could work seven days a week, 15 hour days and still not keep up with the demand. Yeah. So about a year ago, I started the high conflict divorce coach certification program. And I brought in experts from all over the, the world um, to speak on different aspects of, you know, the family court system, uh, legal, psycho psychological, all different um, areas of expertise. And now I train coaches to do what I do specific to the family court system. Amazing. So it's been a, a huge success and wow. it's been good for me because before I had nowhere to refer people if my calendar was full. And now I can say there's this amazing group of, of people who are out there doing this work and I feel confident passing them along um, because I know the training that they've received. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, that is so amazing. And there's such a need for high conflict divorce coaches, you know, because the attorneys are not gonna help with any of that kind of stuff. They just care about like, you know, the facts and all that kind of stuff. And like, you know, they're not gonna obviously coach you through anything. Um, exactly. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a trauma informed therapist who gets it, who can guide you great. But coaching is just, it's a next level when it comes to handling this kind of stuff and healing from it even because, you know, people sometimes underestimate the power of coaching. Like, you know, therapy is great and all that. But when you have someone who's actually been through what you have been through and they're guiding you through exactly what they went through, which is exactly what you're going through, there's just that level of you feel so much less alone and you get that validation and that just makes things so much easier. Not that it's going to be easy whatsoever. It's a shit show process, no matter what, whether right. you're divorcing a narcissist or, you know, going low or no contact with a narcissistic parent or whatever the case may be, it's a disaster regardless, <laughs> but having that support there, because it's hard to find that from your friends too, especially if they've never been through it. Like all you can do is kind of vent, but what are they going to tell you? Right. Right. And that's kind of, you know, what I found is, you know, all of my friends who had normal families and mm -hmm. had never experienced, they're looking at me going sideways, kind of going, well, what's your part of it? What, where are you in the conflict? And mm -hmm. I'm thinking it only takes one person to create yeah. high, a high conflict situation. And that's, you know, so I completely agree. And to find, you know, I, I, when I had my therapist point out that I was married to a narcissist, now looking back, I know how rare that is yeah. because yeah. most of them really just learn the basics, textbook mm -hmm. definition. And there's, there's very little research out there and training on what narcissistic abuse is. And so until that, you know, catches up with the reality of our world, um, you know, the, the narcissistic abuse coaching industry, there is such a need for it because very few therapists do get it. Um, you know, Dr. Romani is an, an amazing resource. And, exactly. and I always send people go watch her YouTube videos, yep. you know, think of it as like a, a Netflix marathon, you know, yep. and, 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 <laughs> And, and she's doing a great job of educating and, and, you know, wanting to train mental health professionals and therapists. And, and there are a lot of them out there that are amazing, but unless you've been through it, um, you know, people just don't get it. Yeah. 
It's so true. And yeah, Dr. Romani is the best. I go to all of her workshops. She's awesome. And I send everybody to her YouTube because like she just explains it so well. And, you know, a lot of the time when it comes from an actual psychologist, it's like more credible in a way. Not that what we're saying is not credible, but like it just adds a layer of credibility to the fact that like, no, you're not imagining things. This is really what you're going through. And yeah, it's so true with therapists. Like most of my clients have either been invalidated by them or told that, you know, they need to change their communication style and stuff about them and all that, which is the same as my experience in therapy too. And it gets you nowhere and it's supposed to help, but it doesn't, which is really sad. It's such a backwards kind of thing. Absolutely. And and one of the big pushes that I've been doing lately is reaching out to therapists, mental health professionals, domestic violence agencies, because what they're teaching, you know, the gray rock stuff is fantastic Mm -hmm. if you don't have kids, right? But when you're using gray rock communication in the court system, Mm -hmm. you look like the problem. You look like you're bitter and jaded and that you don't like this person. And so, you know, I, I cringe when I see, you know, people come to me and they say, well, my therapist said to do gray rock. And I'm like, okay, well, that's going to really hurt your family court case. Mm -hmm. And, and so really learning, you know, that's one style of communication. And then you come into the court system and it's like, you have to learn a whole new language, um, which which you're still allowed to have. I call it yellow rock communication. Okay. Yeah. Tell Um, us about that. I have a little yellow. So it's basically, it's gray rock with a touch of yellow. And so it's still the foundation of gray rock. You're still not showing emotions. You're still, you know, keeping your boundaries but you're adding a touch of politeness or common courtesy. Um, So I tell people it's almost like writing to a colleague or to your boss. You're not going Mm -hmm. to emotionally unload on your boss, but you're going to be polite and cordial. And, you know, I, one of the things I tell people is when you're using yellow rock communication, you're operating from your authentic place of truth. Mm -hmm. So the court gets to see who you really are as a person but you still get to incorporate the gray rock in. I have YouTube videos on it. If, um, if anyone's interested in learning more, they can go to the one mom's battle YouTube channel. And I have several videos on yellow rock communication. Awesome. I'll link your channel in the, in the description of this. So people can just access it. Cause I think that's amazing. The yellow rock method. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. That's really I, smart. I, yeah. Trial and error. I, yeah. I tried it all out. I know where I failed. <laughs> yeah. So now I totally. tell people, don't make my mistakes. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And that makes so much sense. Like, yeah, gray rock, you have to, you have to use gray rock so that you're not emotionally giving the narcissist anything. But right. it's true. At the same time, you don't really have to be a jerk about it. And especially in the court system, you, you want to show the judge and everybody who's basically in charge of your fate in a sense there um like that you're a decent person so if you're just you know very cold about the gray rock then that's gonna backfire for sure so adding a little dash of politeness to it is perfect so I like the yellow rock yeah keeping in mind that you're writing to the judge they are the ones deciding your fate and if you're writing to the narcissist you're giving them too much power and control and so I used to keep a post-it on my laptop and it said to judge CC (laughs) ex-husband and that was just my (laughs) reminder that what I put in writing has nothing to do with him it's all about how the judge reads it and I want the judge to see who I am as a person and and because it matters over time yeah yeah amazing so how are the girls doing now with everything like they when, are living their the best contact life. you know it's we've um they've been they've had peace for a amazing. long time since 2014 and so to them you know a lot of their friends don't even know that they had a biological father. <laughs> like they, yes. been, my husband, Glenn has been in our lives since they were really little. Amazing. And so they just, you know, they, they're living a normal life and they're teenagers Perfect. and um, getting their driver's license and all that stuff. And, and thriving. it's um, yeah. My daughter said to me recently, it was such a healing moment for me. She's 16. And she said, you know, when, when I was a kid and I used to ask you stuff about court or about um, the stuff with 
their bio dad. She goes, it used to frustrate me because you would always say, your job is to be a kid and it's my job to be the adult and let me worry about adult issues. And she goes, I used to get so frustrated when you would say that. And now I'm really glad you just let us be kids because we didn't even know what you were going through. Mm -hmm. And, and that was such a powerful and, you know, it confirmed that, you know, I went with my gut and I'm sheltering them to the best of my ability from this, because it's, it's a lot on the whole family. Yeah. Well, that's the most amazing thing you could have done for them. And I'm so happy that they're thriving and living their best lives. And, you know, I hope that this gives hope to any parents that are facing a similar situation to know that, like, you know, just because this is happening right now, it does not mean that your kids are doomed. Like, they're going to be fine as long as they have that stable parent in their lives that's advocating for them. So just never give up on your kids. Absolutely. And I had to remind myself a lot, you know, they're living their own, you know, they're on a parallel journey. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that are just out of my control. And I have to trust and hope that whatever their life experience is, it's also happening for a reason. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go into the world as resilient, you know, young women because of what they've been through. And, and that was really what I clung to. And um, it has you know, come to fruition. That is very much who they are. And, and, you know, so that brought me a lot of peace during the journey. That's so amazing. I'm so, I'm so happy for all of you guys. Like that's just the best success story that you can ever, even though it took 10 years, you know, it's right. still in the end you won, right? Like the truth yeah. prevails, the truth right. comes out, the reality gets exposed no matter how much the narcissist tries to lie about everything and trying to paint you in a bad light and all that stuff. So I'm super proud of you, your daughters, your new husband, all that good stuff. Like that's so amazing. And how can people find you and sign up for your program potentially? Sure. Um, so One Mom's Battle is my main website and it's just onemomsbattle.com. And then the High Conflict Divorce Coach Certification Program is hcdivorcecoach.com. Amazing. So yeah, I'll have that all linked in the description so people can uh, find that very easily. And can people work with you one on one? Or is it your coaches that you train that do that kind of stuff? So I'm phasing out my yeah. my schedule is really packed. So I'm not currently accepting new clients, but I have a lot of really amazing people that I can amazing. refer to. Amazing. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So if anyone's hearing this, you can be referred to an amazing divorce coach who can help you get through all of this stuff. And they have been trained by the best, which is Tina right here. So we'll have all of that stuff linked um, in the description. And um, do you have any final words for anybody who, you know, is potentially going through a high conflict divorce right now and dealing with all the custody issues with their shared children? You know, remember that it's an ultra marathon and the narcissist trains for a 5k or a 10k. And the reality is that this, you know, being with the kids is really not what it's about for them. And so, you know, they're showing up and, and yes, they can get ahead and they can, you know, take more parenting time, but it's usually not sustainable. You know, once the reality sets in and the feed from the court system is turned off and, and you're out of the court system, the reality of having to parent day in and day out, they're not qualified to do that. It's not sustainable. And that's where I talk about, you know, they, they don't train for the marathon. Um, we are in it for the marathon. And so just keep, you know, it's, it's pacing yourself and uh, just like you would do with training for an actual marathon. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing. I love that metaphor. It's so true. It's definitely, definitely a marathon. Well, thank you so much for being here, Tina, and sharing thank your you. wisdom and your story. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for having me. Take care. Of course. Take care. Bye.